Okay. All right, so thank you everybody for coming tonight, today, this evening. Um, we are very happy to welcome Nicola Banks here to Ize, um as part of our seminars and development studies. <laughs> Um, Nicola Banks is the Associate Professor, uh, Senior Lecturer in uh, Urban Development at the Global Development Institute of University of Manchester. So she developed the research on urban development and on the economic and cultural consequences of urban poverty in the African cities, especially young people. But she has also done a lot of work looking at civil society, developing countries, and especially in Africa, and in what and, and about NGOs in international. She was also had research um, at um, NGO RAP in Kampala, Uganda, and she's also a co founder of Social Enterprise One World Together. She will talk a little bit about that, that's an initiative that is aiming to transform the way uh, grassroots organizations are, uh, are funded. So we invited Nicola to come talk to us today about this report that just came out this year, that is entitled, Where do we go from here, navigating power inequalities between development and geos in the case. So let's hear from you, Nicola, and um, yeah, prepare your questions, because obviously, as usually, we have time for the day. Just one last uh, thing before I um, give the word to Nicola. This is the, our last um, development study seminar, we'll have it on the 29th. Of May, not on a, it will be on a Wednesday because it's the holiday with Daniel Ba. So you're obviously all welcome to join us as well. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, looking forward to you very much. Hi, everyone. So it's a real pleasure to be here in Lisbon again. I enjoyed the EAD conference last summer, so it's a real welcome to uh, come back today. Um, we've just spent the afternoon at the at Camoche, I don't know if I pronounced it correctly, um, having a meeting about the same research with development NGOs and um, a debate with the president of Camoche. And it's really, it's been a really amazing piece of research to be involved in because it has gathered such traction in the sector. Because these are questions that NGOs in the north and south are all talking about, are all discussing, and are all wanting to make progress in. But no one feels particularly confident to be doing things in these areas. So it was it came at a time when there was a lot of appetite for the for the research. Um, I am here today, Peggy. I recommended of a much bigger collaboration of researchers in the UK, the Netherlands, Ghana, and Uganda. Um, you'll see my colleagues' wonderful faces in a minute. Um, but it's been a truly collaborative piece of research, and it's probably one of my favorite researchers. Project to date because of that. It's been, it's been amazing. Oh, wrong way. Okay. So, this is contextualized this research around um, this massive discussion, probably one of the biggest discussions that's happening globally around development NGOs at the moment. We need to shift power from the global north to the global south. Um, and there's lots of talk about it. There's lots of claims that we're pursuing localization, there's been a development. But we actually know very little about what is taking place concretely to reach those goals. So do the actions undertaken translate to transformative change? Are some organizations getting more power and resources to self-identify and kind of self-design programs that meet their priorities? Um, it's a really important that we know what's going on so that that can further inform policy at a time when it's in such great flux. So that's what we aim to do with the research, to examine the extent and nature of the concrete actions undertaken by Northern NGOs and Southern NGOs to tackle power asymmetries, and to see whether the, there's a sort of similar perceptions and actions in those two geographies. Um, and because of that, it explicitly compares the understandings, the perspectives, and the initiatives being taken in North and South, to see where they converge, to see where they diverge, and to begin to sense this kind of tension and discomfort around the ways in which these processes are trying to shift power, but are doing so in a very northern-led and northern-driven way. So here's my amazing team. Um, we had Badru Bukenya and uh, Innocent Kamya from Makarera University in Uganda. 
Um, Emmanuel Kumi and Thomas Yuboa from um, Ghana, the University of Ghana, and then the Quasi University of Science and Technology. Um, in the Netherlands, we had Lars Hoopman, Margaret van Wessel, and Bill Elvis, and then Heis van Sel, who is a PhD student at the London School of Economics. Um, and all of us had the different parts of the, um, the research. We had a survey team, we had case study teams, we had kind of qualitative interviews in the north and in the south, and then we all brought it together in a very lovely way. And I should say before I forget at the end, there are some policy briefs of the summary findings so you still need to take one before you leave. Um, so this is what we're going to look at today. Uh, we're going to situate first the, um, the findings of the report in the context of both academic literature in these fields, but also the practice um, debate, what's happening among NGOs and donors themselves. Talk a bit about the methodology, primarily spend time discussing the findings, um, and then showing you a video, which basically makes the whole presentation redundant, which is why we'll save it for the end. But it's a really nice way of kind of just visualizing in a more narrative form what we found. Finish off with some recommendations and then also talk about the future of this research and where we go from here ourselves. Um, so, many of you might be familiar with um, the very long standing academic critique of development NGOs. So, in 1987, this was a seminal paper on development NGOs when NGOs at the time were very small in scale and small in number. And then you were really praised at that point as being the next development alternative. So they were praised for their strengths of, um, particularly in terms of grassroots orientation, that unlike states or market actors, NGOs are the ones that are close to their communities and can respond to the ways, to the needs of those communities. Um, but it wasn't too long until that was beginning to be questioned by academics. So in the late 90s, this was really held up, this idea of grassroots orientation um, was really questioned because as more and more money had come into NGOs as a sector, they became further and further away from the communities that they were sexualized to support. They actually became closer to governments and donors, as human Edwards say, too close to comfort. And that accountability upwards displays this really critical connection to communities. And those kind of critiques have continued. Um, I worked with David Tumor and Mike Edwards what, like 10 years after their original research, and the, the status was exactly the same in a kind of a dispirited way. Um, NGOs have become more and more professionalized. Yes, the sector has got bigger and bigger and more money is being funded through them, but a professional and highly technical sector is not responding to communities in the way that we first praised them for. Um, more recently, there's a really kind of burgeoning academic critique of kind of taking a more decolonized perspective on development NGOs, the ways in which the system more broadly is so devastating, the ways in which managerialism throughout um, the age chain has really created the problems that we have together. Um, and that culminates in where we find ourselves today, the ways in which development cooperation has been dominated by the ideologies, the norms and the practices of northern donors and no northern NGOs in ways that have institution institutionalized inequality throughout the whole system of development cooperation. Um, in the right-hand column, you can kind of see, uh, so left-hand column is academic kind of critique of the sector, and then on the right is kind of what's happening, the current progress of the sector. It's much more recent. So in 2012, when we start, first started getting, when I first started getting involved in these discussions, NGOs took criticism really badly. But now, these are conversations that are mirroring what they're having internally and collectively in the terms of localization and locally led development. So, at first, localization first emerged in the humanitarian sector in 2016's Grand Bargain. And that same year, Southern NGOs came together, coordinated by the Global Fund for Community Foundations, to start the Shift the Power movement. And what characterizes that is it's southern led. It's southern NGOs coming together to say, you need to do better than this. You need to shift power and resources towards us. Um, and here we are, not quite 10 years later, but locally led development has become very common parlance among development NGOs, big and small, all around the world, people are talking about it. Um, in the UK, where I'm from, 
two years ago, the UK Parliament re released really scathing criticism of the AIDS industry in, in the UK called racism in the AIDS sector. So this really tore apart the fact that we have a system that privileges the, the norms, the ideologies, the technical expertise of people far removed from the problems they're seeking to solve, and kind of took the most radical angle of really to decolonize the sector to do better. So there is lots of talk in all parts of the sector, north and south, but is it being met by action? And until we've done this research, there wasn't a lot of information that, that lets us answer that question. So what do we do? Um, I think what made this research stand out is that it took quite a large scale perspective. That of course has its limitations. We can't look at detail at particular things, but it gives us a, a within line with our research objectives. It lets us really get an understanding, take stock of what's happening. So we we had a mix of um, a large scale survey that reached nearly five hundred, about four hundred fifty eight people from fifty five countries. We did in-depth interviews with um, with donors, with NGO infrastructure in the global north, with NGOs in Ghana and Uganda, um, and then we also did some kind of deep dives, hello, <laughs> some deep dives into some case studies in which NGOs are trying to shift power in both Ghana and Uganda. Um, we also did documents. We asked people to fill out a form, the survey to kind of give any uh, evidence to us that they have on their own programs, and we also reviewed that. We had a standing board of 30 non academic members, um, which kind of looked at our research at every different stage. When we initially discussed it, when we had the survey questions, when we had initial findings, it was a standing board of kind of policymakers, NGOs that are working in the field right around the world. And it was a very useful kind of reflective tool. Uh, we were partially funded by Partos, which is the Dutch kind of network infrastructure. It's a membership-based organization representing NGOs working in global development, uh, which I think is also another reason why we got such traction, because they helped support, generate interest, and then launch it with us. So what are we talking about? Is everyone familiar with this kind of Diversity of terms, and we talk about well, localization, shift of power, locally led development, decolonization. All of these are kind of quite often used interchangeably, but as we'll see as we go throughout the, um, the presentation, they are fundamentally different things, and that's reflected in how people talk about them. Um, localization is more commonly used by organizations in the global north. Um, where it first emerged in that grand bargain, which is the, the idea that we need to send more money to be spent directly by local actors and national actors in the global south. But doesn't really make this question shifting the systems and the structures that distribute that, that uh, those funds and which dominate these inequalities. Locally led development is much more popular among southern NGOs and it calls for, for a more kind of drastic restructuring of the system that gives power and resources to the Global South organizations and gives them much greater autonomy in how to spend them. So what's happening in the area of tackling power up in balances? I think the place to start is by saying that NGOs in both the Global North and South recognize and express frustration at the significant power imbalances that there are across the North and South. More than 90, oh, sorry, more than 70% of NGOs believe that there are significant imbalances. Um, and interestingly, while they recognize that there's a big problem of scale and acuteness, they see themselves as performing better regarding power and imbalances. So the typical answer would be, oh yes, the sector is very unequal, but I'm doing quite well, we're doing quite well. <laughs> And everyone said that, so everyone kind of yeah, self-checks how they see themselves. Um, the biggest system is seen as problematic, and we come back to this at the end. Um, NGOs in the global north want to do better, but also kind of have an escape clause, which is it's the system that drives us to act like this, and we can't do better on our own. Um, but universally, there is a frustration around the negative effects of these power imbalances um, and the fact that we need to move away from them. Um, in terms of uh, what respondents see as the main causes of these imbalances, it's, there are a lot of 
things, a, lot, a varied kind of level of responses, but it's really clear that at the heart of the power inequalities is the question of funding and resources. These are concentrated in the global north, and that equates to power over them, how the system is structured, how it op operates, and how it reproduces for, uh, inequalities over time. Who has the money, has the power. Um, so this is the headline findings around what's happening. Um, and at first glance, it looks quite positive. S sort of 70, 80 percent of organizations are reporting some level of action across these five key areas of activity. Uh, addressing colonial language, stereotyping, taking initiatives to address financial dependence or moving away from restricted funding, trying to tackle unequal decision-making and governance and programming and policy. So in the headline, it looks like there's a lot going on. But when we look below those headline findings, it doesn't seem quite so positive. There are still critical questions within those categories as towards the depth of change that we are seeing. Um, and the first sense of money we get uh, is when we look at who is driving the agenda. So I mentioned this at the beginning. If we're looking at shifting the power, there would be some assumption that there is a, a driving force from the global south as to what an alternative system that redistributes power looks like. But actually, when you look at um, the partnerships between global north and south organizations, um, northern NGOs are clearly the ones that are driving the agenda. Um, uh, the other sense of, dis uh, sort of unease uh, arises when we look beneath those headline findings. So are the actions undertaken addressing the root causing the power inequalities beneath, between NGOs in the north and south? And what happens when you look below those five categories is that though it looks like there's a lot happening, it's clear that the action that's happening are in very early tentative stages rather than representing real substantial change. Um, this becomes clear when we look particularly at programming and policy um, and also at finance. We're going to look at those three areas um, in turn. So looking at policy, there are two kind of key issues that kind of make us wonder is this really genuine and transformative change. Um, the first thing is that the southern partners um, report predominantly that, that activities are limited to conversations rather than actions. So we're very much, I don't know if this has a little left, we're very much at a stage that we're just getting started. Oh. I don't even see where it is. <laughs> Am I on the right page? Maybe. Yeah. No, I'm not on the right. Okay, we're on program. Sorry. <laughs> she completely confused everything. Um, Makes sense to start a policy. So, yes, when we go to policy, it's very clear that um, conversations are happening with Southern NGOs more than the tangible actions that they would really want to see. And then also visible as a, as a favorable shift in accountability that requirements that, oh my God, getting very confused. <laughs> um, and then the second for NGOs, Northern NGOs, is that they are consulting partners rather than taking deeper actions, rather than letting uh, partners get really involved in conversations, co-create solutions, let alone lead solutions. And that becomes really clear when we look at this kind of diagram of, of how NGOs, Northern NGOs are bringing partners into policy. So a third of them are consulted, equally included, 15%, and then putting some of the partner in the lead becomes a really minor part. Oh, I think I might skip through that. Um, so there is more of a kind of a positive success story when it comes to action programming, um, and we see a clear shift in um, direction towards more equal program, more equal decision making um, in program design and strategy reported by both northern and southern NGOs. Um, and then there's also visible a favourable shift in terms of accountability requirements. So anyone familiar with this will, with this kind of sector? Accountability is a massively onerous task for NGOs, both Northern NGOs reporting to donors and Southern NGOs reporting to the, I am the Northern NGO to do them. 
And there's a beginning to see a shift in which um, partners are being able to identify better accountability requirements, uh, being able to report in their own language rather than English, for example, being able to do videos rather than formal reports. And these are really um, positive steps. But again, partner-led programming is much less reported, particularly among Southern NGOs. So what we see is that while NGOs in the South are more powerful in important respects at the programming level, at the policy level that kind of provides the framework for their entire partnerships, there is much less significant and transformative change. And it really is a beginning kind of sense that a shift towards this deeper systemic change seems unlikely. And then funding, but by myself. Um, if we, so we said, saw in that beginning slide that funding was at the heart of all of these problems, which means that funding is an important area of action. And I think it's really important to highlight here um, that rather than this redistribution of funding from the global north to the global south for more autonomous terms, the majority of actions are in support and capacity building for fundraising. So it's the idea, and there's been a lot of money quite rightfully put into this, that if we build the capacity of southern NGOs to fundraise locally, it's a critical ingredient of their long-term spend and sustainability and success. It provides that autonomy and local ownership in a way that funding transfers from the north doesn't. Um, I don't want to be too critical of the fact that there's lots of activity here. Um, if anyone's familiar with the shift of the power movement that originated with southern NGOs, community philanthropy is actually a central part of their strategy. So they want to see a future in which Southern NGOs are not dependent on the global laws. But at the same time, it's very clear that the actions around funding is being taken at this micro level, not around the question of redistributing the large amounts of resources that go to civil society from the global law. So efforts to battle power inequalities are still taking place within a system that's holding onto that power, both in terms of finances and in terms of decision-making over how they're spent. Um, so yes, programmatic changes abound, but systemic action is definitely called for. And we can see this tension in the misalignment between what Global North and Global South organizations say their preferred priorities are for ta taking action. So in, in Northern NGOs want to stay in the comfort zone, uh, looking at individual changes within their partners and narratives. So at the bottom, that's what a third said. Um, Southern NGOs want much greater, they want more than that. They want more uh, autonomy and decision making, strategy, and programs. And these are all the areas where we've seen the least progress in the, um, the previous slides. Um, Southern NGOs are asking for much more than just programmatic changes, one particular program within their bigger partnerships. Uh, they want systemic change, better access to funding, and information that isn't intermediate, intermediated through knowledge of the years. The question is, if Northern NGOs are the ones that are leading the agenda, are they going to take them in that direction? So, looking at the kind of findings around what is taking place, um, the findings of just action are largely being driven by Northern NGOs. They're happening very much at the program level, rather than within the broader policy framework that guides partnerships and, and programs across the portfolio. And more fundamental transformations are not really taking place in those policy frameworks, in funding, or in the governance of partnerships. So those begin to raise quite uncomfortable questions about the tensions and contradictions that are emerging in the localization debate. Whose agenda is being promoted? Um, are the actions that are currently being taken deep enough to address the really serious and structural power imbalances that we have within the aid system? Um, so as well as looking at what's happening, we also kind of asked a bit more broadly about what's holding us back. So in a context in which we recognize everything is new, everything is uncertain, this is a poorly funded kind of, it's, a, it's very high on the priority list, but NGOs don't have a lot of funds and time to deal with them. What is the main barriers that Northern Southern NGOs see to take the best progress? Um, I think universally organizations, North and South, do realize they should be doing more and doing more quickly. Um, 
not many people at all said, oh, we're moving too quickly or we don't need to move. Um, but what is holding them back from quicker action? There's a number of things. Um, the responses are quite varied, but also very illuminating. And you can see again that they do kind of be, uh, there's a few outliers, a few outstanders. Fear, I think, is a big one. Um, and this is particularly the case within Northern NGOs. That fear is both at starting, taking action in a context in which it's new and people don't know what to do, but there was also fear of success. So what happens if we do manage to shift power? What happens if we lose all of our funding and it's no longer about us? What's happening in Sweden right now when where the UK, uh, Swedish government has just cut off um, untied, the untied aid um, and ripped up partnership agreements that Swedish NGOs are relying upon? It could be devastating. And Northern NGOs do have staff that they have to keep and bills that they have to pay. So fear definitely matters. But there's also a clear difference between northern and southern NGOs in identifying obstacles, and this is really important. Um, northern NGOs very much say that their hands are tied, and we think that this is a really big thing that stops them from doing more. So they say, well, we can do we can do a little bit of tweaking here and there, but ultimately our hands are tied by the bigger system. So we receive funding from bilateral donor S. And we get told we have to do that. So they're passing on restrictions down the aid chain to their southern partners and have limited flexibility. And that is quite an obstacle to doing better and doing better more quickly. Um, southern NGOs, as well as significant resource constraints, also highlighted that it was this northern dominance that underpinned their problems. Um, I also mentioned that we did some case studies in Ghana and Uganda. So as well as this kind of broad scope and mapping process of what was happening, we wanted to do a bit of a deep dive into case studies to see what was happening in much more detail. Um, you can find, if you look at the main report um, in the appendices, there's very deep, detailed um, case studies going on. Uh, so in Ghana, one of the programs we explored was a northern-led program that was aiming to build local resource mobilization capacity among national NGOs. So we saw that as an area where a lot of NGOs were taking action. Um, and then in Uganda, we explored a five-year project that was seeking to distribute power to get more power and resources uh, between international, national, and local NGOs. So they created this really in innovative and powerful kind of local coalition of humanitarian NGOs in the north of Uganda. And all of these, both of these, displayed some real strengths when we were looking at kind of, is it transformative? Does it really make a substantial difference? And in areas there were some really amazing things happening. We saw that there was co-creation of partner priorities for project ideas. So finding ways to kind of dilute that northern-led thematic priority identification and making sure that programs are more um, locally owned and designed. Uh, more joint decision-making and accountability, greater flexibility afforded in project planning and delivery, and then capacity building, yes, but not capacity building led by Northern partners, asking Southern partners, what is it, the areas that you would like to build on and trying to find ways to, to build it that way. Um, and then in Uganda, it was this, recognition that civil society can be strengthened collectively as well as within your um, international partnerships. But there's always a but in this academic study. Um, the research also showed that the deepest, root, the deepest rooted inequalities still prevailed. They had just shifted to the global south. Um, and we really do, when we saw these kind of case studies, thought, are we shifting power or are we shifting the problem? Because the system hasn't changed, it's just they kind of devolved it to the, the national level in, in the global south. So in both contexts, Northern donors shifted power to a poor national implementing partner. But again, the same aid chain exists, so they still remain accountable to the donor. They're still tied to project timelines, they're still tied to managerial mindsets, log frames, reporting requirements. And they just had no room for manoeuvre. So they became the actor that was struggling to live up to the locally led development promise while trying to fit within the Northern framework. So priorities have to still fit within the overall strategic plan. A lot of the national partners um, 
sorry, the core national partners are the, are the box. So they're the, what is currently the Northern NGOs. They're the ones that say you want to work on this, that, and the other. And local organizations still felt like implementing partners. They still felt like they didn't get to say in designing something that was more locally relevant. And what you see is that you have a new hierarchy of inequality. It's just taking place in the global south. So there's big differences between national organizations and local organizations, with national organizations replacing uh, the northern NGOs. The other thing that was so clear is that the, the, the kind of tied to, to project-based approach is this short-term idea that we can solve very impractical development projects on a three-year or a five-year timeline was catastrophic. So in Uganda, there was some real successes in what was going on in terms of bringing local actors into these really powerful decision-making spaces that they've never been before. But in five years' time, when the project was finished, this coalition and this platform disappeared because there was no one funding it anymore. So this absence of core and longer-term funding threatens organisation sustainability, um, and especially that is in terms of staff and turnover. Sorry. Um, so, overall, we found a shared agenda. Northern and Southern organisations both want a better, more equal future. Both parts of the um, globe are excited at where we are. There are many actions taking place, but Northern NGOs are in the lead, and the root causes are not addressed. So changes are taking place at the program level, not at the broader systemic level that might reach more transformative change. And then we have a lovely video to <laughs> show to show you a bit of a roadmap of how we might move forward from this thing that was stuck with. Did you see? And it gives me a time to rest my foot. How we were asked to keep our resources with their fellow and partners is one of the key ways that I must have put on the question. Don't need to please. Please be clear that I am not the right way and allow me to pass on the other way to you. The end of the world will be the most important thing now. Actually, that we think is that we should be able to pass on the other way to the other way to the other way. Discussion they could be laid and dominated by the North, in the past market of Northern Indian, having the issue with such a strategy to prepare the offering of people's Southern Indian. This is important whether the people of Indian should have been able to speak or not. We must have to be taking the key power, focus on funding or programs. However, the majority of these actions are based on promoting Southern fundraising. Really, I'm really I'm really I'm really I'm really the really 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 Rather than thinking what you could be, let alone be in the lead. So, what is that with us back from reaching and matching? At the moment, actors think they are able to speak power and be better than the norm. In fact, they are able to do more. 
radical or modern action to make sure that genuine change is outside their own sack of information. Many of southern NGOs, however, claim that the lack of progress arises from modern data are only in this end. So, what to guide the way towards systemic change? Reaching towards formative change requires that one, modern NGOs move from reaching to supporting southern NGOs in taking the driving seat. Two, all NGOs move beyond their own individual partnership. Challenge the power distribution of the border aid system that sustains top down decision making, source distribution, and data setting. Three, call upon institutional donors to unite and as core aspects of the aid system, take a lead role in redesigning it. Four, open the community the barrier that any single space while accelerating the limited room for a number that can pass the donor restriction. Five, address the angle, allocation of financial resources and funding conditionality that drive inequality in any system. It's up to all actors in the global aid system to look beyond the individual partnership and to get the responsibility for the broader system when they operate. Plan for the individual impact, this impact of political view and do report for more details. Yeah. Understanding of the right and meaningful insights from data is fast becoming the most. Anyway, we start. We don't start with video because it's a very nice illustration of the entire content, and then you wouldn't have to listen to me for forty minutes. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's a really nice visual way of highlighting the problems and also looking at some uh, recommendations to northern NGOs and the bigger um, aid architecture, development cooperation architecture across the system about what they can do to bring some organisations to the centre of um, these agendas to which they are currently quite peripheral. To stop northern NGOs only thinking about what they can do in their partnerships and to make this a much bigger collective organisation. A collective kind of ambition and, and project. Um, you can find the report and the video here. I'm not sure you will have your phones ready to get it, but you'll find it online or it's probably linked to some of the promo for this event. Um, and then we finished this research and we thought, well, where do we go from here? I think one of the lessons we've learned as we've kind of spent a lot of time talking to NGOs and policymakers around this is that they are really wanting more than what we currently have. So they don't want a project entitled, where do we go from here? But also some research that helps them more tangibly kind of work out how they can move forwards from the situation that we now find ourselves in. Um, so for us, the, we call ourselves academics, research and power imbalances. <laughs> this finding that the video really clearly um, ended on about the fact that we need to move away from individual and programmatic change to much bigger collective change that spans not just the global north but also the global south. Move from individual partnerships and actions towards collective action. At the moment, we're in a situation where this discussion, these actions are being um, taken in rooms like this or in the room that we were in earlier at Met Crouch, where we're bringing northern NGOs in different countries. Together to divide working groups about how they can promote local development, but keeping that quite closed. So we have this, the same process going on in the UK, the same process happening in the Netherlands, but we need to have that conversation where local South organizations are at the forefront of the discussion. Um, so, in all of the kind of northern countries that the, the research team um, comes from, network organizations play a really central role. So Platforma here, in the UK it's Bond, in the Netherlands it's Partos, who helps get this research off the ground. But nobody is funding southern network infrastructure 
to the same extent as far as you know. Nobody is yet asking why are they not the actors that are being supported to have these conversations at the national level in Ghana, in Uganda, in other southern contexts. So for us, we'd like to do some more research into that question. What's happening and what role can network organisations play? Um, and what would it take to put network organisations at the heart of shifting power and funding in ways that don't bring them into um, being parts of the problem as the new intermediaries but very unequal aid? Um, so quite, a, quite a shift uh, in style. Um, one of the things that I am most proud of um, is I'm very much an academic, I write papers, we do grant proposals, but having been set to these issues time and time again, I've been looking at this for 10 years now, I began getting much more involved in kind of conversations, engagements with NGOs in the North and South. I joined a social lab that brought NGOs and donors together to try and work collectively outside their own partnerships to work out what they could do to, to release the inequalities in the system. And actually, as an academic, as someone outside the sector, quite disillusioned and realised that if you want to look at the idea of funding and why we can't get more unrestricted funding reaching the global south, for the same reasons that that video has just shown, the system doesn't allow it. It's not set up to work on that. It's set up to work on professionalism and managerialism. So together with um, my very close friend, Chipway Henry, we co-founded One World Together. So we're basically trying to create an entire new system powered by global citizens, people like you and me, people that want a fairer, more ethical world, and building a movement based on really small, affordable donations that we can give directly to community-based organizations around the world. So we have partners in um, Kenya, two partners in Kenya, one in the UK, because we believe poverty and equality is not just in the global south, it's everywhere. Our UK partner was inspired by one of our Kenyan partners, so that idea that we can learn from innovations and amazing community action in the global south. And then we also have a partner in Zambia. Um, so this, I guess for me, is what feels like where my career has led me to, not just from researching power inequalities, but also to tackling them and realizing that we all are dependent on the policymakers, the donors, the Northern Nigerians to fix things. We have the biggest opportunity to fix things because we do things differently. We just can choose an, an approach that is um, based upon different values, values of class, solidarity, equality, not based on values of value for money or uh, measurable outputs, but just get money straight to brilliant community organisations. So we ask people to sign up for a membership, to become a global citizen, for as little as five pounds a year. That's the bit that covers our operational costs. That's the kind of allegiance with a movement, a statement that we want a better world. And then a monthly contribution to a solidarity fund, which is as little as a pound is 25 a month. And we pool those contributions um, on a quarterly basis, give them to our four partners to spend exactly how they want. We're, um, we've got over 100 global citizens now. We're generating around £350 a month in completely unrestricted funding. And that's to, in an audience like a room full of NGOs that are working in the millions of budgets. Sounds like nothing. But you see the power that it's having for our partners, even when they get £200 every three months, it's massive. Um, it allows them to respond to crisis. It allows them to increase salaries so they don't lose staff. It allows them to pay for an away day to have a day talking about well-being and strategy. It allows them to do community outreaches and take a slower approach to program design. It's really quite transformational. So we have a long way to go <laughs> to become this financially sustainable organization that is really able to provide a good sum of income to our partners, but we want that to be long-term, predictable, and unrestricted, because without that, we cannot have fun fundamental transformative change. Um, so yes, that is been my most exciting success. <laughs> and then that's it. Thank you very much.